Can you hear us? Can you? Okay, over. Me, we are sinking. We are sink. Hello. This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Good night, too. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, whoever you're doing it with. I'm Legal Vices, and welcome. It's Maritime Monday. For those of you here for the YNW Melly trial, it's been on hold for until next Monday. So we are here. We have a full Maritime Monday show in store for you tonight. And it is dealing with the USS Thresher, the nuclear submarine. Um, very, very quickly, some of the background housekeeping stuff to do. Uh, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button. As always, deeply, deeply appreciate it. And if you have already hit that subscribe button, just do a little double check to make sure you're still subscribed. That would be absolutely wonderful. And StreamYard is being odd today, so it's it's uh, it's duplicating everything that I send out. So I may be a bit spotty responding to chat, but I'm reading everything because I have to go into the YouTube studio to respond to chat so it's not doubled up. And we have the like and subscribe poll. Once you've hit the like and subscribe, take care to uh, take the poll. Very simple today. Did you hit the like and subscribe button? Of course, I'm new around these parts, but yes. And thanks for the reminder. Done. Short and to the point. And let's see, there's really not a whole bunch to, to talk about before we get going. Just uh, really quickly, this uh, the weekend preview, I guess. Tomorrow we will be catching up on the day... 11 afternoon of the YNW Melly trial. Thursday will be OJ Simpson. Well, wait, wait, what are you doing? Wednesday? Oh, Wednesday we'll have uh, Eric Hunley on. We're going to be talking about some uh, body language expert analysis. Uh, he's going to try to convince me that it's a, it's a, it's a step above witchcraft is what I, what I said. And that kind of upset him a little bit. So he's going to talk to me about that. And uh, then we're going to look at a particularly to me anyway, distasteful body language expert. And Thursday will be OJ Simpson. Friday will be my birthday stream with a huge panel of guests. The FIF, you know, the F at Friday rules will sort of apply it there. We'll, you know, we'll play it sort of by ear, but we're going to have fun on my birthday. But today is a, a little less than fun topic to talk about. It is the loss of the USS Thresher. So let me get things set up here in the in the background oh you <clears throat> uh flux there's member for 10 months ben hales and broken wings thank you so much for that message 10 months better not waste it and then promptly proceeds to waste it <laughs> thank you flux but a little we're having a little a little bit of a sensitive topic here today so i'll re we all read the re we all read the word and we all saw it but i, mean, I will refrain from reading it tonight if you yeah all right. Um, all right. Before we get into this very, very serious topic, um, Nicholas Starov, thank you so much for your super chat. I have a sinking feeling about this ship. Thank you very much. <laughs> and a shout out to Lincoln Kane for sending his people over here. All right. Well, where where to start with this one? This is this is kind of a major incident, and bringing this up, you know, it, this falls pretty much in line with uh, a follow up. This is a great follow up. We've been doing some of the Titan submersible streams the past couple of weeks. This follows well on the heels of that, and this was part of the the discussions I was going to be having with my with my dear good friend. We were going to talk about this. His submarine acts and other and other underwater developments, but uh, as I mentioned previously, we found out he's not able to talk about any of this until he leaves the leaves the Navy in November. So in, the, in November, we'll probably revisit this. We'll also talk about a few other uh, incidents involving submarines. And Lincoln Kane, Jeff's birthday stream Friday. AU, let's go. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lincoln. It's deeply, deeply appreciated as always. Mm. Cheers. And let's go, Brandon. Eat, drink, and be merry for Friday. We sink your ship, slash, you know, parentheses, liver. All right. Game on, then. Uh, but let's turn to this more serious topic here. 
So back in 1963, the U.S. Navy submarine called the USS Thresher it sunk, taking the lives of 129 crew members aboard. Not only was it the first nuclear submarine accident, it was the worst nuclear submarine accident in history, and the second overall worst submarine disaster in history. So what exactly happened to the craft remained a mystery for years until a retired Navy submarine captain called James Bryant filed a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit in 2020, which ended up forcing the service to release its report on the sinking. And thousands of pages of documents were released. So most of what we, the public, know about the incident today is due largely to the efforts of James Bryant to bring the information out into the light. But interestingly enough, still 60 years after the accident, the technical details in that report are still redacted. So there's, there's still some things we don't know about the capabilities of the sub, uh, but we've been able to piece together quite a few things since then. Well, how did, how did all of this begin? Back in the mid-50s, the U.S. Navy was pushing nuclear propulsion out to its entire submarine fleet. Now, now the majority, I'm not even sure if all of the submarines, all of the submarines at this point may be nuclear submarines, but the majority are. And nine classes of submarines were created, including the sailfish, the barbel, the skate, and skipjack classes, before the Navy felt it had a design worthy of mass production. And they proceeded to classify this as the Thresher class. The Thresher class would be uh, ultimately built 14 of them. They built the first one, and then uh, they, based on that, they ordered 14, uh, 13 more. So the Thresher class were designed to be fast, deep-diving nuclear attack submarines. They were the second class after the, the previous category, the pioneering shipjack, skipjack class. They were designed with new streamlined hulls that we still use today, this teardrop shape. They were the first submarines to use the high-strength HY-80 steel alloy, which was used through the 1980s on the Los Angeles-class submarines. Now, they, they're not overly large submarines. They're just 278 feet in length, and there's a, they have a beam of 31 feet. They weighed 4,369 tons submerged, making them about 30% larger than the skipjacks. And their SW, S5W pressurized water reactor drove two steam turbines, which turned a single propeller to a combined 30,000 shaft horsepower. So 15,000 times two gives you that uh, 30,000 shaft horsepower. This gave them a surface speed of 20 knots and 30 knots submerged, just about 33 kilometers an hour. Well, I guess about, no, about 35, 33 miles per hour, I guess. Uh, this was a noticeable improvement over the underway speeds of the skate class, which could only manage 22 knots. So the, the uh, Thresher class was named after the Thresher shark. And the first Thresher, the one we're talking about today, was ordered on 15 January 1958. And it was built by the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. The keel was laid down on uh, 28 May 1958. And then it was launched on 9 July 1960. And after going through all the tests and everything else, it was commissioned on August 3rd, 1961. The motto, the motto of the ship is Viz Takita, you know, Stylent Strength. So I guess I guess 33 knots is 38 miles per hour. So that's a, and it held a complement of 16 officers and 96 crewmen. Well, that, that sort of leads up to the, the beginning of where we want to go with the video today. That was a little bit of the background information. And for all good things maritime related, one of our favorite sources always, always provides top-notch, in-depth analysis of, of these types of accidents is Brick and Mortar. So we're going to Brick and Mortar again. Down in the link, you can see Brick and Mortar's 
channel and a link to this particular video if you want to watch it in its entirety without me interrupting. Uh, it's right down there in the link. Go there and make sure you subscribe to him. He's just started to uh, do a, a co-op with Attorney Tom regarding the, the uh, maritime compensation things and sort of the aftermath of some of the, the other uh, maritime-related issues that he's done based on U.S. law. All righty then. Let's let's jump into this. I there's not a lot of places to to interrupt and talk during this because he is so thorough and there's so much information that he has packed into such a a short 30 minute video that large chunks of this we're just going to sit back and watch because I I couldn't say it better and there's not a lot that I could add to it but we'll we'll pause occasionally to talk about some issues as we go along. Named for the Thresher Shark and the first of its class, the USS Thresher SSN-593 was laid down at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Kittery, Maine. This vessel would pioneer a new, more modernized fleet of nuclear-powered attack submarines in the U.S. Navy. Again, go, go down to uh, the, check out the Being links. the first of its class meant, as originally planned, those that followed would have been Thresher-class submarines. Thresher SSN-593 would actually be the second submarine to take the name after the first Thresher, SS-200, a diesel submarine that served successfully throughout World War II and was decommissioned in 1945. Launched in July 1960, the nuclear-powered Thresher would, according to the U.S. Navy's Judge Advocate General Court of Inquiry, or JAG, report, revolutionize advances in sonar equipment, the ability to resist shock, and would operate with reduced noise radiation. According to the U.S. Naval Institute, the Thresher performed initial sea trials in April of 1961. This new class of sub would combine the roles of attack and hunter-killer to combat the threat of their Soviet counterparts with what was at the time the most advanced sonar in the bow, equipped with the latest anti-ship and anti-submarine torpedoes. The Thresher would measure in at 278 feet 6 inches long, 31 feet 8 inches wide. It's reported that the Thresher was expected to dive to some 1,300 feet, or roughly a quarter mile deep, reportedly the deepest of the time period. It had a reactor power plant that gave the sub unlimited range and a top speed of more than 20 knots. Under normal operations, the crew consisted of 16 officers and 96 enlisted men. At the official commissioning ceremonies in Portsmouth Shipyard, August 3, 1961, Vice Admiral Harold T. Duderman declared, Thresher is not just another ship, Thresher is totally different. After the commission, the Thresher underwent further sea trials and exercises off the Atlantic coast, and according to the U.S. Naval Institute, that sailing work, as far it? south as Puerto Rico. While in port in San Juan, the crew encountered problems with her diesel generator and then had difficulty in restarting her nuclear reactor. Shock tests followed, with the Thresher subjected to a greater intentional pounding than any other submarine in Navy history. She stood up remarkably well, with Commander Axine stating, there was no question that the Thresher suffered damage, but it was all relatively minor. The damage we sustained did not impair the ship's ability to operate, and much of it, such as the damage to vital sonar tubes, we could repair ourselves with our store of spare parts. After more extensive testing and trials, the Thresher would return to Portsmouth Yard in July of 1962. Mm -hmm. They would host what was called a Happy Cruise, where wives, parents, and children were allowed to come along for a family-themed embarkation. The vessel would then return for extensive, nearly year-long scheduled maintenance work. With the crew and vessel essentially laid up, Commander Axine would also state, Relations between the Thresher and Portsmouth were always extraordinarily good at least in my experience, but he quickly added, it is true that we felt they should have been more efficient, should have done better work at times and move more quickly, and they should have done a better job of cleaning up after themselves. I was told by others that relations did deteriorate toward the end of the post shakedown. By now, this is this is a little bit of an interesting thing here, I, th I think. So they, they tested it and they found some issues. And some of the issues that they found, uh, rather than going over them here, 
brick and mortar is going to talk about then at the end of the video, some of the problems that they found and some of the changes that those problems uh, initiated in after this accident. But basically on 16 July, 1962, the thresher went in to start a, a uh, dry docking post shakedown availability to, ex they were going to examine all of the systems, make repairs and all the necessary corrections scheduled for six months. But this is a first of its kind, or as they call it in the Navy, the first of its class, first of a class submarine. The work took longer than expected, and it lasted nearly nine months. And once this was completed, note how quickly things start to go wrong. The, the ship was recertified and undocked on April 8th, 1963. So keep that date in your mind. April 8th, 1963. Because things things start to go wrong very shortly thereafter. April of 1963, after around nine months in the shipyard for post-shakedown, Thresher was being prepped to finally depart Portsmouth and resume sea trials, growing ever closer to being fully operational. The sea trials were to take place roughly 250 miles east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Assigned as the submarine's escort for the trials was the USS Skylark, a 205-foot Penguin-class submarine rescue ship. This small escort was fitted with all manner of sonar and communication devices needed to maintain contact with U.S. submarines. So this, this ship uh, played a pivotal role in this incident, and uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about what, uh, what, what this ship's involvement was. I mean, they were the, spoiler ahead, they were the last person to hear, the last ship to hear from the submarine. And as long as we are, are paused here, just uh, wanted to bring up Justin Wright with the $20 Super Chat. The channel sub brief has a better breakdown of the Freedom of Information Act data dump called 37 pings. The, he does, he addresses the, uh, the view of the accident as it was reported by one of the subs that was searching for the sub, uh, rather than the, the general overall prelude to the accident and what happened after the accident, et cetera. It was a, he, he dealt with one specific part of this 1,700-page uh, data dump, and there's a, there's a few things that have been criticized about uh, about his his report. But we're also going to be talking about some of the things that were that under that occurred while the investigation, while the, well, not the investigation, while the search was underway. But if you do want to check out sub briefs later, uh, go to sub brief and check out his Thresher video that he did about a year ago, I believe. 10 months, but, but 10 months to a year ago. But they were, we're, we're talking about a little bit of different things, but some of the stuff that he mentioned in his video, we are also covering in this one because I am legal devices. I am all knowing, all powerful, and all semi prepared. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. And we had a one month member chat from Louise Tattenall, the clean and sober crew for one month. So hi, I just wanted to let you know, I love everything about your channel, including your fur babies. Thanks, Vices. Oh, they're, they're, they're here sleeping. That's so, so grateful. Thank you so much for that. I deeply appreciate your comments. So let's, uh, let's jump back to this and see how rapidly things started to go awry. And when performing its intended duties, the two vessels would make attempts to operate hand in hand, so to speak. According to the JAG report, the Skylark also carried a rescue chamber with a max depth of 850 feet. Hmm. There we go. The Thresher would get underway on the morning of Tuesday, April 9th, bound for their first rendezvous with Skylark, roughly 16 miles southeast of Kittery. According to the JAG report, on board for the trials were 112 Navy personnel comprised of 96 enlisted sailors and 16 officers, 17 persons on board working as civilian contractors to witness the trials from Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, Raytheon, and Sperry Corporations. 129 souls aboard. The two vessels reached the coordinates at about 9.49 a.m., established communications, and the Thresher performed a scheduled shallow dive. Completing this first encounter, their second rendezvous would be roughly 300 miles east planned for the following morning. Each ship would proceed independently with the intention of meeting up again at the predetermined coordinates. On its way there, the Thresher traveled both submerged and surfaced, 
testing brief dive sequences and full power propulsion. The Skylark arrived near the coordinates at 7.45 a.m. This area of the Atlantic was roughly 8,500 feet deep, or 1.6 miles. The sea was calm, visibility was about 10 miles, and no other ships were known to be present in the area at the time. Thresher reported in to Skylark, stating that they had the vessel at about 3,400 yards away. They were currently communicating via the underwater telephone system, or UQC, that the escort ship deploys to a certain depth for listening, and works even with a submarine submerged. The UQC system receives and transmits sound, much like sonar, and turns these signals into audible voice transmissions like a phone call. Yeah, so just, just sort of think of it as like a very, very early sort of a precursor to a, a digital conversation where it's, they just use the sound waves and then they they reassemble it. Sort of, I guess it's like sort of what you would do with a record player. I'm trying to, I've been trying to think all day of a good analogy for this. It's, it's basically, you know, you send the message out, it gets broken up into sound waves, it gets collected at another place and then put back together, sort of like Mike TV and Willy Wonka and you know, <laughs> Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, where it goes from one side to the other and they pick it up. So it was very early technology. And they would do this by lowering literally the, the, the speaker microphone unit down into the water, probably three, 350 feet, somewhere around there. And while we're paused here, another $5, you don't have to keep super chatting, Justin, another $5 Justin Wright super chat says, thanks. I really like having a sonar man go over this. It's not like the government hasn't lied and hid things from us before. Oh, don't worry. We're getting there. <laughs> we'll get there. As you notice from the th thumbnail, I had a big old classified stamp across it. We'll, we'll, we'll be getting there to whether or not the government lied and maybe lied again. Or whether everything is just perfect and no one lied to anybody. Yeah, we'll we'll get there in just a little bit. Hang tight. I promise we'll get there. All right. Let's dive back into this. Where have we gone? Here's our, here we are. It can also aid in range finding its source. However, Skylark did not show any contact on Thresher on their main sonar at this time. The Skylark sonar said to have a maximum of 3,750 yards, the submarine possibly outside their range. Regardless, Skylark hadn't plotted Thresher's position, only knew of their presence via the brief communications back and forth. By 7.47 a.m., Thresher reported via phone they were beginning their deep dive test. This JAG report shows it redacted, but later reports stating the expected test depth would be 1,300 feet deep. Okay, now this this is right about the time things start to go a little bit askew. But uh, before the, the the my understanding of the of the thresher was at this point in time the the normal test was it was the normal test depth was uh, 400 meters. I guess to check the maneuverability and whatnot. But then they also had the deep dive sea test depth, which was the 1300 feet. So they you know they they would mess around do all, do all the other stuff about the 400 foot level. And then they would dive down to 1,300 feet to do the deep sea, the, you know, the deep dive tests. And they would do this in 30 foot increments. It was, yeah, 30 foot increments. They go down 30 feet, do a few tests, send you know, collect a little bit of data, go down 30, collect a little bit of data, and they would just keep doing this. Now, the thing to keep in mind as you're going through this is light. I mean, I know there's, there's really no windows on a submarine, but when you're considering the search, all of this had to be done essentially in the dark because light normally only penetrates to 200 to 1,000 meters under the, the surface of the ocean. So about 650 feet to about 3,280 feet. And below that, it's just pitch black. It's dark and it's quiet, generally speaking. But when you're operating solely on naval equipment, it can be very, very loud. Machines make a lot of noise and water is an amazing conductor of sound. Which, which kind of comes into play in a little bit here. 
or roughly a quarter mile. Skylark held position as Thresher reported initial course and depth changes, but still hadn't plotted the submarine's position. Yeah, so the what he's saying here is that uh, the Skylark, which was the support ship, the, the, the submarine rescue ship, lost the submarine. It was out there somewhere. They just sort of misplaced it. And they were trying to get in touch with it. And before we get too far afield, I did want to give a special th- shout out and thanks to Wolfram, who has gifted five legal vices memberships. If you are one of the lucky recipients, make sure you give Wolfram a hearty thank you. At 9.13 a.m., Skylark received another transmission from Thresher stating, Experiencing minor difficulties, have positive up angle, I'm attempting to blow. We'll keep you informed. From the U.S. Naval Institute, have positive up angle implies that the submarine had recovered from a down angle, possibly caused by a stern plane's jam. The report of attempting to blow up confirms that the MBT blow was ineffective. The MBT, meaning the main ballast tanks, blown by using high-pressure air forced into the water-filled tank, forcing the water out rapidly. Okay, so the, the ballasting of the ship, what's th- what that is all about is when you want the... Let me do this. When you, when you want your ship or your submarine to sink lower in the water, you have these ballast tanks, which are essentially just empty tanks. If you want the ship to go down, you fill them up with water and the ship will, will settle lower in the water. Or if you're the submarine, you fill them up and it will help you sink. Now, if you want to go up, you pump the water out of the, of the ballast tank and you fill it up with air. So that sort of creates, I mean, essentially balloons. You just, you have these, it's it's like if you're holding a balloon under the water, it'll quickly rise up. So you're filling what was once filled with water with air. So that lightens it up and increases the buoyancy and that will raise you to the surface. But when you're, when you're blowing the ballast tanks, you're doing it very, very rapidly. You're forcing the air in at a high pressure, high speed. And that's why you're saying this is something that uh, is normally reserved for emergency conditions. Now, it, it should also be noted that the, the, the thresher has been to the te- test depths about 40 times. So it's not the first time it's going down to these depths. It's been down to the test depth about 40 times. But now things are really, really starting to go wrong. Creating a buoyant, air-filled tank. Typically an emergency servicing procedure and the process that creates those spectacular shots of modern submarines blasting to the surface. It's unclear whether the thresher meant this as an emergency blow of some sort, but many experts say this was a sign of an emergency, despite the seeming lack of urgency in the verbiage used to describe it. The need to blow the tanks at all, rather than controlling the vessel's pitch via forward velocity and dive planes, as would be standard procedure, suggests the vessel was indeed in serious trouble already. Yeah, the dive planes are like the the wings. According to experts. But it's possible the Thresher's command remained confident in the vessel and crew to troubleshoot themselves out of the situation. Skylark promptly responded to advise them the area was clear and let them know Skylark's course. Oh, darn it. Have I... I do that every time, don't I? Y'all know me. Y'all know I have a problem. Whenever I want to, whenever I put away the video to make a point, I always have a problem of remembering to bring it up because I'm looking at the video. I'm not looking at the screen that's showing me whether the video is up or not. So, yeah, we're going to go back just to, we're just going to go back a little bit here so, so we can we can bring you guys back up to speed. All right. <clears throat> I'm sorry about that. My apologies. <laughs> I could get hired as an aide for the Biden team. Nice. All right, let's let's go back to the video. And while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to bring it up right now. Right, here we go. This is where we left off. Typically an emergency servicing procedure and the process that creates those spectacular shots 
of modern submarines blasting to the surface. It's unclear whether the Thresher meant this as an emergency blow of some sort, but many experts say this was a sign of an emergency, despite the seeming lack of urgency in the verbiage used to describe it. The need to blow the tanks at all, rather than controlling the vessel's pitch via forward velocity and dive planes, as would be standard procedure, suggests the vessel was indeed in serious trouble already and had lost propulsion, according to experts. But it's possible the Thresher's command remained confident in the vessel and crew to troubleshoot themselves out of the situation. Skylark promptly responded to advise them the area was clear and let them know Skylark's course, bearing an approximate range. So then they at 9.15 of... a.m., Skylark asked, Are you in control? Repeated. They sort of kind of found the submarine. They got the message. Now, this is at 9.15. This is two minutes before everything goes to hell. Two days after it was recertified and relaunched. So basically, it gets put back in the water, and two days later, we find ourselves in this situation. So 9.15 a.m., the Skylark says, hey, are you guys, on, do you still have this thing under control? Did this and carried out radio checks. One minute later, 9.16 a.m., and Skylark heard a garbled transmission. You need test depth. Only making out the words test depth, which many have since surmised that the word exceeding is most likely what preceded this. Ugh. Exceeding test depth. Then just after that, 900 North. Only making out the words 900 North, or an indication they were on bearing 90 North. During this time, though, the Skylark heard two disturbances that could have been the blowing of ballast tanks. But yeah. soon after the final transmission, 900 North and 918 AM, according to the report, a much clearer, high energy, low frequency disturbance was heard that had all the characteristics of sudden implosion. So, that. At 9.17, the Skylark gets the last unintelligible communication from the Thresher. Then just one minute later, the navigator of the Skylark hears what sounded like a ship breaking up or imploding. Uh, but regardless of what happened, regardless of how, of how the implosion occurred, well, let's let's take a step back. There there were noted problems with the vessel before the accident happened. The uh, when they were doing the after they were doing the first year review of their operations, and which also contributed them to going back into the into the shipyard for the nine months to get everything fixed and fitted out again. The commanding officer's evaluation of the first year of operations before this additional work was done, it praised the submarine but also said that the submarine was overly complex in many areas, and he noted a vulnerability of the auxiliary saltwater system. He said, in my opinion, the most dangerous condition that exists in Thresher is the danger of saltwater flooding while at or near test depth. Again, keep that in mind. He says, in my opinion, the most dangerous condition that exists in Thresher is the danger of salt water flooding while at or near test depth. So whatever, whatever happened, whatever failed, something, I mean, something obviously failed and there was this catastrophic implosive incident. The last nine minutes from 919, from 909 to 918, and the, the end was quick, water pressure increases 44.5 pounds per square inch for every 100 feet of depth. And for every 33 feet of depth, the pressure increases by one atmosphere. So what that means is that at 1,950 feet down, which was the thresher's crush depth, at 1,950 feet down, uh, what's that in? Let's ask what that is in meters. Can I, I know I have like a meter side of my brain and a I like I have metric and I have imperial like sides of my brain and they don't communicate well with each other. Convert one thousand nine hundred and fifty feet to meters. Yeah, 
594 meters. So at 594 meters, at 1,950 feet, which is the crush depth, her hull was experiencing 86,000, 86,775 pounds per square inch, or 43.4 tons per square inch. That is a lot of pressure. Imagine every square inch of this submarine being pushed upon by 43.4 tons, 86,775 pounds per square inch. It's estimated that when the final collapse came, it took about 100 milliseconds or 0. 0.0001 seconds with an implosion force equivalent to 22.5 kilotons of TNT. And what that means is for that one brief instant, 0. 0.0001 seconds, the inward implosion was greater than the yield of the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. that ship imploded. It contracted with more force than the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. And not by a little bit. This was equivalent to 22.5 kilotons. The bomb over Hiroshima was 15 kilotons. So you're about half again as strong as the atomic bomb over Hiroshima. Yeah. That's the story. Before we before we get going here, let's double check here and make sure we're on top of things. Dillagaff says, wish I could stay. Work beckons. We remember Thresher every year just before the submarine birthday. Thank you so much. That. I, hope, I hope you're still here to hear that. Uh, and Lisa Franceschi, strawberry. Oh, yeah, she was that, that was Yoda that was snoring a little bit there a second ago. Thank you. Thank you so much for the super chat. And double checking here to make sure we have yep, we are good. Skylark continued attempts to contact the thresher. And I'm bringing no up the video. I'm bringing up the video. Don't yeah. panic. They began dropping their emergency hand grenades in the water. These were used as rudimentary signals in case of communications failure to convey the message to those listening on the submarine <laughs> that they need to return to the surface immediately. The sky. So again, they, they can't communicate with it. They think it's imploded, but they're still dropping these grenades down in the water so that uh, you know, if it's still there, they, they say, get up, you know, get to the surface. That was their signal to get up to the surface. Uh, Amnuk, A M N U C C Scorpion may happen. I don't know yet. Uh, it's I'm thinking. I Lark then decided at 10:45 a.m. to send a message they'd prepared, reporting. The what do you mean I'm not listening? I'm not listening to what? Hmm. Okay, whatever. I think I'm. Yeah, all right, whatever. The loss of contact with the Thresher. This message sent to Naval Radio Station NBL, or Station New London, Connecticut. However, there was difficulty in getting the message through. Skylark shifted to an alternate frequency, with Station New London finally acknowledging at 12.45 a.m., two hours later. Mm -hmm. The message as follows. Unable to communicate with Thresher since 0917, have been calling by UQC Voice and CWQHB CW every minute. Explosive signals every 10 minutes with no success, meaning they're hand grenade signals. Last transmission received was garbled. Indicated Thresher was approaching test depth. My present position, 41-43 north, 64-57 west, conducting expanding search. The JAG report pointing out that this message lacks some critical information that, by the report's wording, suggests should have been sent in such a situation. 
while Skylark began their expanding search pattern using their QHB-A sonar system as their principal means of underwater detection. The initial parties to join the Skylark on scene would be the Rescue and Salvage Ship USS Recovery, ARS-43, and a number of patrol aircraft. It's clear from the reports that the USS Recovery arrived that same afternoon. And that same afternoon, this is the afternoon of the 10th of April. And there were also other ships that were around the, the area. I'm, so, I'm sorry, no, this, this was the, the 9th of April, the day of the accident. There were other ships that came in later, which we're going to talk about, that came on the following day. At 5.30 p.m., the recovery spotted an oil slick 1,000 feet in diameter of bluish color, about seven miles southeast of Skylark's position. The destroyer USS Blandy, DD-943, then joined later, having gotten underway from Newport, Rhode Island at about 6.30 p.m., and the submarine USS Seawolf, SSN-575, yeah. arrived on scene at what looks like 5.30 a.m. the following morning. Yeah, so what happened with the Seawolf, the, 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 the Seawolf, they got the message on 10 April at 2.39 p.m. That they were to order, they were ordered to search for the Thresher. And the the Sea Wolf arrived the following morning at, at, at the search location. Uh, some reports have it at 900 hours on the 11th. The JAG report stating Command of the search force passed from Commanding Officer Skylark to Commander Submarine Development Group 2 at about 5 30 a.m. All right, I've conf I confused myself. Sorry. <laughs> the ship sank. It was launched on the 8th. It sank two days later on the 10th. Forget everything I said about the 9th of April. It sank on the 10th of April. The, the other ships that were there, they were just talking about, they arrived on the afternoon of the 10th. And the afternoon of the 10th at 2.39 p.m. on that day, on the 10th, that's when the Thresher uh, was, that's when the Sea Wolf was ordered to go search for the Thresher. So the Sea Wolf was in the general vicinity, and they were expected to arrive at the location at around 900 hours the following day on the 11th. And that's uh, that's when they got there. So sorry, sorry for that little bit of inconvenience there. I wanted to correct myself. April 11th, 1963. While operating as a unit of the search force, the USS Seawolf recorded possible electronic emissions and underwater noises. None of the signals which Seawolf received equated with anything that could have been originated by human beings. Now let's talk about that for a little while, shall we? I think we should. We should talk about that. So, the the sea wolf, while it's searching, has picked up some sounds. And later it was said that none of the sounds could have been from human beings. And by the way, again, the Navy classified all of these reports for over 50 years. All of the reports relating to this incident were classified and sealed for more than 50 years until uh, the lawsuit, the Freedom of Information Act lawsuit was filed and they were ordered to release these documents. They were still somewhat redacted. But uh, the, the conclusion that they reached was that uh, none of this could have could have come from any human source. So, was the Navy hiding something? I mean, why not? Re why not release mundane details about it? You don't. You need. You don't need to re to uh, release the you know the, the specs of the equipment, the specs of the sub. But let's see what you guys think. Keep in mind, and uh, this. This is what we were talking about a, a little bit ago with Justin Wright talking about uh, subbrief and the things he talked about, because this is kind of the same things that I want to talk about. This one particular set of documents was the action reports filed by the Seawolf at the time of the incident. This is their report of what they experienced, what they heard, what they saw, what they did. 
Let's see what you think about some of this information that's included in this report. So, on 10 April, they're ordered to go there to search for the thresher. They arrive early in the morning on April 11th, day after. And at 9.20 a.m. on April 11th, the uh, Seawolf is ordered to search in shifts of two hours, search submerged for two hours. As they're, they're starting their search, they found some debris in the area around 10, 10 a.m. But then they started their, they started, officially started the first dive at 10.32 a.m. on 11 April, again, the day following the accident. And the Sea Wolf, because they're hunting another submarine, they're running as quietly as they can. At those depths, they have to use their electric engines. They're listening for the thresher, any sounds that they can pick up. We saw this with uh, the with the Titan just very recently, where they were, you know, they were using sonar. They were listening for things. They heard that mysterious banging. Um, that's what they were doing here while they were searching for the thresher. And speaking of searching for the thresher, in his monthly chat, Nicholas Starr of Trial Watch. Three months member of the Clean and Sober Cruises pro tip, don't name your fragile submarine after a metal genre. Well, first of all, it's not really a, th a fragile submarine. And second, it's Thresher, not Thrasher. <laughs> Say Thresher. <laughs> Thank you for that, Nicholas. So they're listening for the Thresher. The Seawolf is. As it descends, they go down to 400 feet, they go down to 500 feet, they go down to 600 feet, and a little bit deeper listening, looking out, trying to find the missing submarine. Well, a little over an hour and 20 minutes later, at 11.52, they pick up a target approximately 2,000 yards away. And the Seawolf proceeds to close on the target. They triangulate where it is. They finally they, they pinpoint where it is. And they confirm that the target's not moving. It's a stationary target. And then something very interesting begins to happen a day after this alleged implosion was heard. At 12.11, 11 minutes after noon, they hear a tone, a tone on a distress frequency from a system that's called the BQC. It's basically a beacon or a pinger that is manually engaged. It's not an automated system. You have to do whatever you have to do, you know, pull pins, flip switches, whatever, to engage this system. They heard a manually engaged pinger or beacon at 12.11 on the day following the accident. They believe they had found the thresher. So over the next several minutes, the sea wolf tries to communicate with the thresher. They're sending messages. like saying, turn your BQC on and off. We hear you. Request steady keying on BQC. Send us a series of five dashes on BQC. They're sending these messages to the thresher, hoping to get a response. And the sea wolf then reports that they believe they may have heard some keying on the BQC system or a series of dashes. But the destroyers that were patrolling the surface and using sonar and their engines and communications, they were too loud. They were making too much noise. So at 1229 hours, the Sea Wolf decides that they have to cut this first dive short and they have to go to the surface and tell all of the other ships on the surface to be quiet, stop using their sonars, and to be as quiet as possible. So an hour later, they start their second official dive. They go down at 1341 hours on 11 April, the day following the accident. The Sea Wolf completely unplugged their own BQC system to make sure it wasn't emitting any signal, and they dove to 400 feet and started to try to communicate with the ship again. They're sending the message if you're receiving, 
key your BQC. If you hear my transmission, key your underwater telephone. Then, about 15 minutes, 14 minutes later, at 13.55 hours, 1.55 p.m., the Seawolf heard three tones on 23.5 kilohertz, which is the BQC frequency. They heard three distinct tones on the frequency of the Thresher's BQC frequency for their, uh, their, their emergency beacon. And they hear continuous tapping. This indicates to the Seawolf that someone or several people may still be alive on the Thresher a full day after the accident. So the Thresher, they step up communications. Their, their attempts to communicate, they step this up. They say, if you can hear me, transmit your underwater, transmit on your underwater telephone. Then the Seawolf hears two separate BQC tones. That's interesting because depending if there's damage to the the uh, front of the sh front of the sub or to the aft of the sub, the rear of the sub, you don't want to put one system, your entire beacon system in one section. So the submarine had two BQC beacons, one for one in the front, one aft, one in the rear. They had these two systems. So as they as they honed in on this, they heard two, two distinct tones from two different sources. So they, they think they've got the fore section and the aft section of the submarine still intact. That doesn't mean the, the middle section couldn't have crushed and maybe the reactor or they, they tested for some for nuclear waste, you know, nuclear radiation in the water, and they they didn't find any. They they they've tested positive for some, but then they realized that their their uh, testing was in error, and there wasn't really anything out there. So maybe they didn't breach the core the, <laughs> of of the, the nuclear core of the engine. So congratulations for that. That was a very lucky thing. But perhaps you know the middle of the ship was crushed, and there were still people on on either end that could operate these you know, emergency beacons, but we don't know. But they're hearing these two distinct beacons. And they send the message to the thresher. We hear your underwater telephone. Send five dashes. They continue to give these instructions in an attempt to confirm and communicate with the thresher. Now, the interesting thing they find out next is that these two signals, one is 23.5 kilohertz, which we talked about was the uh, was the BQC beacon, and then they narrowed the other to 3.5 kilohertz. Now, again, according, and as we were talking about here in the Super Chats, that Justin Wright was mentioning, uh, the sub-brief talks about this part in very good detail, in, in very, very good detail. And according to him, 3.5 kilohertz is the mainframe sonar of the submarine. Their mainframe computer or their mainframe operation system was operable at this point in time. The the uh, Sea Wolf the Sea Wolf believes. So they're thinking they're getting one beacon, one distress beacon at 23.5 kilohertz, and the ship's main sonar system is transmitting at 3.5 kilohertz. So they may be getting some, these, some signals from the Thresher's mainframe sonar. This means there would have had to have been people alive to manually operate this equipment to send the signals that the Seawolf is getting. They wouldn't be on the bottom of the ocean, you know, way below the crush depth. It was what, what's it, 8,500 feet? They wouldn't have been down there. So that indicates that they may have been, the, the Seawolf may have been picking up the Thresher at some point between a crush depth and the bottom of the ocean. Or even, even further above the crush depth, but below the testing threshold. They had reason to believe that the Thresher was floating and drifting underwater with people still alive in it 
a day, a full day after they reportedly heard it implode. So at 1424 hours on that day, the 3.5 kilohertz signal ceased. For whatever reason, they, it stopped and they never heard it again. But the thresher is supposed to be a pancake at the bottom of an 8,400 foot depth ocean. It's supposed to be on the bed 8,400 feet below. But during this time, they picked up a total, the, the sea wolf picked up a total of 37 pings from the pres presumably destroyed thresher. 37 pings from the mainframe sonar were picked up. Well, they thought this was majorly important because obviously it was. At 1427 hours, at 227 p.m., they, they went up to 100 feet so that they could report what they had just been experiencing and what they had heard and what they had found. And then at 14, yeah, three minutes later, they went back to 400 feet deep. And they heard an actual voice transmission from somewhere. It was indecipherable. They heard a voice transmission. Three minutes later, they hear another voice transmission. So the sea wolf continues to try to communicate actively with, you know, the send us the signal, send us this. But the sea wolf had to resurface and end dive number two at 15.05, 3.05 p.m. Yes, that's the, the Yoda is scratching around on his bed. That's the, that's the scratching noise you're hearing. They begin dive three a little under an hour later at 3.53 p.m. at 15.53 hours. Seawolf continued to try to communicate at 400 foot depth, a 600 foot depth, and a 500 foot depth, four, four five, and 600 feet deep. About 40 minutes later at 1634 at 434 p.m., the sea wolf begins hearing metal on metal banging. They keep making the request, bang five times. And then at 1647, 1650, 1653, more bangs are heard, but not the number, not, not the five bangs that were requested, just more metal banging. And the people, the, in, in different parts of the sea wolf, both said definitively they heard these signals. At 1656, at 456 PM, they hear banging in groups of three, they think this might be them trying, the, the people in the thresher trying to send an SOS signal. They continue to hear tapping. 1719, they continue to hear more tapping. 1755 hours of 5.55 p.m., they try to rendezvous with the other vessel that was there, the sea owl, but they can't find the sea owl that they're supposed to rendezvous with. They finally find it at 18, 18 hours. And again, they're, they're trying to hear, but it's too loud in the area. So what the sea wolf does is they're trying to get the sea owl to go tell all of the other vessels to go away. Just, just leave the area. We're trying to listen down here. So then at 2010, they have active contact again. They continue trying to communicate. Now, remember, they, they were supposed to go down in two-hour dives. And this second dive, I mean, sorry, this, this was the third dive they were on. It started at 4.34 p.m., 16.34 hours. They're already at 8 p.m. They hear, and at 8.39, to, at 20.39 hours, they've been down for four hours. They hear more banging. They're down for five hours. At 21.37 hours, so that's 9.37, the sea wolf asks for three bangs, and the sonar heard three bangs, followed by two bangs. And again, they'd been down five hours, three hours longer than they should have. 
So they had to return to the surface and they completed their dive at 2,300 hours. They started dive four about four hours after that, about four hours and 15 minutes after that at 13 at 0318. So 318 AM on 12 April. They go down and they heard nothing, nothing more. The dive ended at 552 AM on the 12th of April. So, depending on what you think and who you talk to, the people on the Seawolf, they believe that it appeared that there were at least several people alive on the Thresher for more than a day. A day and a half, nearly two days. Was this why the report was kept secret for 50 years? To not tell the family that they, you know, the, the families that their loved ones may have suffered and just basically suffocated to death or were crushed in a series of accidents. Was this why it was kept secret for 50 years? It's not unreasonable to take that view. I mean, that's a pretty reasonable view to take, which, uh, you know, <laughs> particularly in light of the fact that if we look at the Titan submersible incident from several weeks ago, look what happened there. We have the Coast Guard telling us, oh, we're hearing, we're hearing these knocking sounds every 30 minutes where there might still be alive. We're searching. We're continuing to search. When the Navy heard at the time it happened at 1.45, one hour and 45 minutes after the Titan started to go down, they heard distinctly what they described as an implosion. They told the Coast Guard about it, and the Coast Guard did not report it. So maybe this happened 50 years ago, 60 years ago as well with the thresher. I mean, it's, you would want to say, nah, that seems a little bit unreasonable. It must've been some other reason. But when you look at what happened just a few weeks ago, you go, oh, okay, they, you know, that sort of seems to be standard operating procedure. You hear an implosion and you just don't bother to uh, let people know. Well, this is where we, uh, this is where we get into a little bit of an interesting quandary with this report. So I'll ask you right now, uh, does it sound like there may have been someone alive on the Thresher from what you were taught, from what the, the uh, people on board the Seawolf are reporting? I don't know. What's your opinion? What do you think? Does it sound like the Thresher may have survived and was doing their best to communicate and say, hey, we're still here. Get us out of here. Well, let's go back to what we heard over on uh, Brick and Mortar a minute ago. The inquiry later, the inquiry into the accident later, and bear in mind what you just heard coming from the people that were on the Seawolf at the time this, they, they, they experienced these things and made their reports. A later require inquiry report found that while operating as a unit of the search force, the USS Seawolf recorded possible electronic emissions and underwater noises. None of the signals which Seawolf Seawolf received, none of the signals which Seawolf received equated with anything that could have been originated by human beings. That's the official line. That's the official line. None of the sounds, none of the the metal on metal banging, none of the pings, none of the 37 pings on the frequency they heard, none of the the tapping on the hull, none of the you know the noises that they heard, none of them could have originated from human beings. That's the Navy's official line. And this was I guess emphasized by Bruce Rule um, who was a, uh, he was part of the inquiry committee. He said, the form is correct. The say wolf's form is correct, but the final report certified it was false readings. Now listen to this here. We have on one hand, the Navy inquiry report finding that none of these signals 
equated with anything that could have been originated by human beings. But again, the guy who was part of the inquiry panel is talking about it, saying, yes, they, the sea wolf was correct, but the final report certified it was false. The say the sea wolf. I keep saying say wolf because one of my pipe maker friends calls himself say wolf. So sorry about that. The sea wolf was confused by the active sonar and noise created by the destroyers and the diesel submarine sea owl searching for the thresher on 11 April 1963, the day after she was lost. She mistook all sounds from the searching ships as banging on the hulls and sonar pings from the thresher. It was a mistake. Do, do, do you see a problem with that? Do you, do you see any problem there? I do. We have one saying none of the signals received equated with anything that could have originated by human beings. Then you have someone saying, no, no, they heard all of these things, but all of these things originated from other ships. So was it nothing originated from human beings or were these signals originating from other ships in the area? That's, uh, that's like an either or situation there. That's, that's a one or the other. You can't have that one both ways, that none of these were human-made and all of these were human-made, but from some other ship. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry for that lengthy diversion there, but that is a very, very interesting thing. We have three very conflicting reports from the Seawolf who actually conducted it from the final report and one of the guys that testified. But the Navy's official line remains. Nothing, nothing they heard could have originated from human beings. And let me bring up the video here before I forget to do that. And we'll continue a little bit with the story. We'll move on to the next phase. Mandy, Mandy, thank you so much for the super chat. Sea, sea Wolf says, ooh, yeah, yeah. By the way, Sea Wolf is one of my favorite stories ever. I love that. Book. What a great book. All right. Bring it up the, bring it up the screen. And that naval units and personnel were assisted by civilian scientists and research ships. The initial search and rescue efforts would never produce any positive results. Now, even if they had located the thresher right away, the potential for any sort of deep sea rescue, especially in the time period, was extremely limited. The USS Skylark, with its wide array of relevant communications and detection equipment, was still completely powerless to physically render assistance at technically anywhere below 850 feet deep, the limits of its onboard submersible rescue chamber. In addition, carrying out rescue missions of submarines beneath the surface is an extremely precarious undertaking, even in the most ideal conditions. The typical rescue chamber, for example, carried on board a vessel like the Skylark, had very limited capabilities. The stricken vessel must not be in waters with a strong current, and it must be upright as the chamber cannot attach at extreme angles, and again, being limited to 850 feet. In this situation meant even the planned test depth was too deep for rescue. This exposed, according to the Navy themselves, yet another critical limitation in their deep sea capabilities. Yeah, the, the deepest undersea rescue to date is 1,575 feet. And we'll most likely be talking about, this is the Poseidon 3 rescue, we will most likely be talking about that next week. So this, you know, <laughs> this is way beyond that. And that was in 1973. And this was in 1963. Which we will cover briefly in this video. Initially found in or near that original oil slick the night of the sinking, picked up by the USS Recovery and Skylark, were small bits of debris, which revealed a much larger, grim truth. Something catastrophic must have happened to the USS Thresher. Later lab tested and confirmed to be from the Thresher, which could have only reached the surface of the vessel it broke up. From the Glasgow Herald, a pair of work gloves used only in the nuclear reactor section of the Thresher. Bits of cork of a special design for interior insulation. 
bits of plastic used to protect reactors from leaking radiation throughout the ship. These pieces amongst many other very small plastics and styrofoam. With no sign of the vessel during what could only potentially be considered a window of search and rescue opportunity due to the debris and oil slick. Due to other detailed findings we'll cover here shortly. According to the JAG report, Thresher was lost at sea with all on board at about 9.18 a.m. on April 10th, 1963. And that's the official line that they're sticking with. And none of the sounds heard after that moment in time were made by humans. The official the line. JAG, Court of Inquiry, to get to the bottom of this incident was put into action the same day of the sinking. This official report ruled out sabotage and enemy action. And from what I see cited as primary evidence of the instant implosion and breakup, aside from the communications and sounds as the incident unfolded, is the wreckage, which, without a doubt, appears to be catastrophic breakup. The search for the thresher, worthy of a video on its own, evolved from, quote, no real search organization, no search technique, nor specific operating procedures, starting on the day of the incident, all the way to a massive operation of military acronyms, three separate major groups, the seafarers, the onshore support group, who could acquire the needed tech and vessels for searching so deep, and the analysis group, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the Office of Naval Research, the Submarine Development Group from New London, the Naval Oceanographic Office, using fathom meters, deep-toed Geiger counters, side-looking echo sounders, and in the final phases, deep-sea-capable TV or still cameras, either towed or mounted to a capable bathyscaphe. But finding a bathyscaphe capable of traversing the near-abyssal depths in the area Thresher was lost proved difficult. According to the U.S. Naval Institute, no one was quite sure whether or not the Thresher would return an echo from the surge fathom meter. No one was quite sure that the navigation in the disaster area could be carried out accurately enough to ensure 100% fathom meter coverage of the ocean bottom with a minimum of duplication. No one possessed any real operational experience at towing a magnetometer, Geiger counter, TV camera, or a side-looking echo sounder 15 to 200 feet off the bottom at depths of 8,400 feet. In fact, the design of the various sensors was, in April, merely a topic for discussion, or at most, in the preliminary purchase of parts stage in the various oceanographic laboratories throughout the country. The Bathyscaphe Tree Stay, a storied vessel itself, played a major role toward the end in getting some of the clearest shots once the thresher was located in its final resting place, 8,400 feet deep. Well, we'll talk about finding that here in just a little bit, in just a little bit. The scene described by the officer in charge of Trieste as like a huge automobile junkyard with big pieces of heavy metal all over the place. It's even been reported that researchers sank derelict cars and even a decommissioned diesel submarine to gauge drift and currents in an effort to locate the thresher. This process of searching and documenting took over a year and still wasn't fully complete by summer 1964, but the picture was definitive the thresher had experienced catastrophic breakup. At this depth, the thresher was found toward the bottom of the bathypelagic zone, nearing the abyssal zone. Why it was testing in water so deep, I have no idea, but with no safety net, so to speak, below their test depth, not even near their purported collapse depth, there was very little room for error, and in a vessel fresh out of post-shakedown. This, combined with the fact that while U.S. Navy submarines do have their maximum dive depths classified to this day, there's still a limit to what's physically possible based simply on the technology we mortals have to build with, even for those venerable submarine manufacturers. Submersibles you see diving several miles deep or more, they're small for a reason. Physical size limits the vessel's ability to withstand the unimaginable forces it must endure in the deep and it's no secret that military nuclear submarines are rather large, thus more surface area to reinforce. From the U.S. Naval Institute, the U.S. Navy constructs submarines to withstand one and one-half times the pressure of their design test depth. This is a safety factor. The collapse depth is based on both mathematical calculations and model tests. It thus seemed reasonable to assume that the collapse depth of the thresher was approximately 1,950 feet. 
sequence of casualties, marine casualties referred to in this instance as accidents or mm -hmm. incidents that can cause a vessel major issues. The sequence of casualties suffered by the thresher apparently caused a fateful depth increase of some 600 feet from test depth to collapse depth in five agonizing minutes. As she neared collapse depth, the fittings and pipes would have begun to give way, admitting powerful jets of water that pushed aside men as they struggled to plug them and shorted out electrical systems, making corrective action impossible. The additional weight of water thus admitted would have driven the thresher still deeper at an ever-increasing speed. The submarine's hull would groan under the increasing pressure trying to crush her air-filled interior. There probably were no serious personnel casualties to that point, but all in the submarine would now have sensed that they were rushing toward disaster and groped frantically for some means of escape or survival. The insulating cork that lined the submarine's interior would begin to crack and possibly flake off. Pipes would pull apart as the water pressure began to pull the submarine's hardened steel like taffy. The hull would then implode. Complete destruction would occur in one twentieth of a second, too fast to be cognitively recognized by the men within the submarine. Millions of pounds of water under tremendous pressure would smash the submarine's hull, breaking it open, twisting portions, disintegrating other parts. The theory that water filled the plummeting thresher before she could implode is generally discounted because the additional weight of water would have accelerated the downward rate and caused an implosion before the hull could fill with water. Now, the Skylark was the only vessel in the vicinity, aside from the submarine it was assigned to monitor. With experts at the helm of Skylark sensors, mm. it would be standard practice to know via distance, intensity, and angle which sounds correspond with what type of source. This is one of the foundations of sonar operation and listening devices utilized in the world of undersea detection. It's not just Hollywood ping noises and bright green radar screens. Even I know that much. This incident, though, as many may have noticed, isn't like those I normally cover. There is an incredible amount of nuance to both how it happened and the recommendations and industry changes that came as a result. But there are very thorough reports out there for those who know where to look. We'll be doing a brief summary in today's video, but I am planning a follow-up for later to dig into That'll the massive amount of detail and recommendations found by both experts and authorities in the time period, and then later unearthed via Freedom of Information Act reports. So keep an eye out for a follow-up, or as I call them, my afterwards episodes. Possibly a live stream, but either way, we'll dig deeper, and it'll give me some time to gather my thoughts and pour over a myriad of documents on what eventually became a rather controversial subject in the world of military submarines. Mm. The Thresher, its crew complement, and dedicated civilian contractors, 129 souls on board, they led the way to, firstly, the SubSafe program. This is At a House Science Committee meeting in October 2003, U.S. Navy Rear Admiral and Deputy Commander for Ship Design, Integration, and Engineering stated the following. The loss of Thresher and her crew was a devastating event for the submarine community, the Navy, and the nation. The Navy immediately restricted all submarines in depth until an understanding of the circumstances surrounding the loss of the Thresher could be gained. While the exact cause of the Thresher loss is not known, from the facts gathered during the investigations, we do know that there were deficient specifications. Okay, this this is what I was going to talk about at the beginning, but I thought uh, as long as he's going to talk about them here in pretty much exactly the same details that I was going to talk about them, I figured it would be better better to let us sit here and uh, wait for him to, to do as part of the video. But listen to uh, how this was done, how these investigations and testing was done be before it went into the the repair stage. Deficient shipbuilding practices, deficient maintenance practices, and deficient operational procedures. Here's what we think happened. Thresher had about 3,000 silver braised piping joints exposed to full submergence pressure. So 3,000 piping joints that were exposed to the pressure. Out of 3,000, they inspected 145 of them. During her last shipyard maintenance period, 145 of those joints were inspected on a not-to-delay vessel basis using a new technique called ultrasonic testing. 
14% of the joints tested showed substandard joint integrity. Extrapolating these test results to the entire population of 3,000 silver braised joints indicates that possibly more than 400 joints on Thresher could have been substandard. Yeah, that's a lot of potentially substandard joints. One or more of these joints is believed to have failed, resulting in flooding in the engine room. Remember what I said was the commander, the, the, the commander's major concern. He thought the major weakness was the potential flooding of salt water at or near test depth. Well, gee, I guess it makes it even more likely if there's some substandard joints in place that, that just might help some of that seawater get inside. The crew was unable to access vital equipment to stop the flooding. Saltwater spray on electrical components caused short circuits, reactor shutdown, and loss of propulsion power. The main ballast tank blow system failed to operate properly at test depth. We believe that various restrictions in the air system, coupled with excessive moisture in the system, led to ice formation in the blow system piping. The resulting blockage caused an inadequate blow rate. Consequently, the submarine was unable to overcome the increasing weight of water rushing into the engine room. Mm -hmm. The loss of Thresher was the genesis of the subsafe program. In June 1963, not quite two months after Thresher sank, the subsafe program was created. Let's talk a little bit about this. I want to go into a little bit more detail than uh, brick and mortar goes into about the subsafe program. Oh, it's, and some of you were saying even though they knew this, they still let the they still let they still thought it was a good idea to set sail. Well, is, you'll notice that he mentioned that this was done, this inspection was done on a not to delay the vessel basis. That means we don't want you to do anything that's going to delay the vessel. They, they were going to sail. So they, they wanted you, they wanted us to do this inspection in the way that was least likely to interfere with their departure date. Uh, how do they know this? Because they have the reports. The reports found because it went, it, I don't know if, if you had missed it at the beginning. I don't know if you were here or not at the beginning, but it was, it was in service for a year. Then they went back to do the one year testing and inspection to finally do the performance things. And during that is when they found the 114, when, when, when they found 14% of the inspected uh, joints were, were substandard. So extrapolating that out over the 3000, there could have been as many as 400 of, of the joints being substandard. But uh, this, again, if, if good things can come out of a tragedy. Um, one of the first policies that was put into practice was subsafe. Plans for subface were drawn up in June 1963, like the same month that the Thresher failed. Uh, so it was within the Bureau of Ships, but the program was not implemented until February 1964. The, the subsafe program strengthened the quality control of submarine construction. And how did it how did it do that? Well, let me let me embiggen myself here because we'll be we'll be paused here for a little bit and apologies for dog snore in the background. Strawberry is really sawing some logs there. Uh, <laughs> wow. The subsafe program strengthened the quality control on submarine construction and reduced the number of and types of piping in connection. There were three main areas the subsafe addressed. First, was the rearrangement of systems such as compressed air valves to the main ballast tanks so that they were simpler and they wouldn't, as he's going to talk about here in a minute, ice over. They wouldn't ice over during full ballast release and were more accessible during an emergency. The second was the silver braze joints and other faulty fasteners. The third was the changes to training submarine personnel. So regarding the silver, the silver braze joints and fittings, each fitting had to be inspected on all boats. You can't just take a representative sample, a ra representative random sample of the joints and inspect those. Each and every one of those 3,000 fittings would have to be inspected. In 1962, a method of inspecting silver braze joints was developed at Murray, Naval, uh, in, uh, at Murray Island Naval Shipyard using ultrasound. A group was assigned to review submarine development, and one of the goals of this group was to determine which joints could be welded or if they had to be silver brazed and inspected with ultrasound. Well, fasteners, castings, pipe fittings, studs, bolts, 
all had to be reviewed and inspected. No more sampling. They all had to be reviewed and, expect, and inspected. Another task of the, was, of the group was to rearrange the systems so that they were more accessible during an emergency, like the compressed air valves, but also the drive plane, you know, the wings on the submarine, the wings and the tail fins, that they, they could be more easily uh, controlled in an emergency. So the group, they had a much greater impact on submarines overall, either on the slipways while they're being built or soon to start construction. And this information is uh, is coming from the, the National Archives. Uh, so for the submarines that are already in commission, they had to be certified sub-safe before they'd be permitted to dive more than half of their test depth. This was hugely expensive, hugely costly, because each boat fitted with miles and miles of piping and electronics and fittings had to be inspected. Every inch of these miles and miles and miles of piping had to be inspected before it could be certified. Now, another outcome of the Thresher disaster was the development of the Deep Submergence Rescue Vehicle, the DSRVs, which uh, Brick and Mortar is going to talk about again in a little minute here. These are these self-propelled midget submarines that would get down to a stricken submarine in depths greater than the rescue bells from World War II, which was, what, 800 feet they were talking about? And the project, that began in 1965 uh, with Lockheed Missile and Space Company. They were contracted to develop this the prototype was finished in 1967. The first DSRV was the Mystic. That was commissioned in 1970, and she's rated for a depth of 5,000 feet. But again, we've only had a, sub a submarine rescue up to 1,575. It was a submerged vehicle rescued 1,575 feet. And, but the Mystic could have two crew members and could accommodate 24 passengers. And it ran on battery power, so she was independent of a support vessel. I mean, she, sorry, she was dependent on a support vessel. And one of the features of the Mystic was that she could be put on board a cargo plane and flown anywhere that she's needed within hours of an accident. I think it was a 72-hour when she could be anywhere on planet Earth in, within 72 hours. Instead of being shipped like the Trieste had to do in 1963. So another feature of these deep-sea uh, rescue vehicles was a universal collar which could connect to any escape hatch on any submarine, domestic or foreign. So it could be used in the rescue of foreign submarines. Well, thankfully, her and her sister, the Avalon, have never been used and never needed to rescue an American crew. Now, you remember a while ago, we talked about the Russian submarine, the Kursk, that sank in August 2000. We, we mentioned, we briefly mentioned that the Americans had offered help and the Russians refused. We had offered to provide the Avalon and the Mystic to help the Soviet, I guess they were Russians at that point in time, the, the Russians to, uh, we were, I'm old, okay, we, we had Soviets when I was growing up, the, the Russians. We offered to help the Russians by allowing the, you know, the Mystic and the Avalon to go down and try to rescue their crew members, but the Russians refused, and all 113 sailors on the Kursk were lost. Their own, rescue, uh, their own rescue vehicles were obviously unable to do it. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap this up here with the, the last few minutes of brick and mortar, and then I've got a few parting words, and we'll call it a day. The Subsafe Certification Criterion was issued December 20, 1963, formally implementing the program. According to threshermemorial.org, the purpose of the Subsafe program is to provide maximum reasonable assurance of watertight integrity and recovery capability of a submarine. A culture of safety is central to the entire Navy submarine community. This starts at the designers and includes builders, operational crews, as well as maintenance organizations. The subsafe program clearly defines non-negotiable requirements, requires annual training of personnel, and then ensures compliance with reviews, including audits and independent oversight. The annual training requirement includes review of past failures, including the loss of thresher. In addition, the Deep Submergence Rescue Vehicle, or mm. DSRV program, was right. also heavily inspired by the loss of the thresher. According to NavalUndersea Museum.org, 
The sinking of the submarine USS Thresher, SSN 593, in April 1963, revealed significant limitations in the Navy's deep sea capabilities. The Navy formed the Deep Submergence Systems Project in 1964 to develop a new rescue vehicle. The project produced two highly capable submersibles, Mystic DSRV-1 mm -hmm. and Avalon DSRV-2, that launched in 1970 those and are, 1971. Those look really small to hold 26 people, don't they? But uh, reportedly they could. So a very cramped position, but I think if you're being rescued from the bottom of the ocean, you probably don't care how tightly packed in you are. Following extensive sea trials, they entered full operational status in 1977 and served as the Navy's primary submarine rescue system through 2008. The DSRVs could deploy by sea, air, or land to reach a... Okay, they look a little bigger now. <laughs> that was a bad angle. They look a little bigger now, don't they? Okay, you can, you can fit 24 people in there. Disabled submarine anywhere in the world within 72 hours. Once on site, a mother submarine or submarine rescue ship carried the DSRV within range of the distressed submarine. The DSRV then attached to the submarine's escape hatch and transferred stranded personnel back to the support vessel in groups of 24. Although the Navy conducted numerous practice exercises with the DSRVs, they have never been used for a real rescue operation. No American submarine has sunk since the DSRV program began. With the loss of the USS Thresher, there would be no lead ship for the Thresher class namesake. This passed on to the next vessel launched under the same class, the USS Permit, and thus the Permit class forged ahead. Now, interestingly enough, my my submariner friend has said that even though the, the the Permit class was the official title, everybody still called them the Thresher class. I thought that was that was interesting and fitting. Comprised of thirteen submarines that all saw successful, roughly thirty-year life cycles, all of which decommissioned successfully. And unfortunately, from what I can find, were also then recycled and none survived as museum ships. One of our favorite family activities is visiting and getting immersed in museum ships. <laughs> anyway, the USS Thresher has had many memorial ceremonies and dedications. Among the many static memorials, perhaps the most poignant, the monument in Arlington National Cemetery being one of the most prominent as it only recently was dedicated, September 26, 2019 and multiple memorials in Kittery, Maine, the home of Portsmouth Naval Shipyards. Thanks so much to those who support this channel, and an extra special thanks to our top tier Patreon supporters. Alex S, Alex W, Andrew M, Kenneth P, Nathan F, Paul R, P Rush, Philip B, Robert G, and Troy H. And don't forget, your safety matters. And that, that, is, that is the end of the uh, brick and mortar video. I kind of wanted to end it there after taps. I really don't like talking after someone plays taps, but uh need to do a few things first and tell, tell another little bit of side of the story here. And you'll notice one thing up here in the uh, left corner of the video. You'll see we have attorney Tom here doing a, he's doing a collaboration with uh, brick and mortar about some of the legal after effects of some of the maritime cases that uh, brick and mortar covers. And they just released earlier today, a little update on the El Faro incident the, the aftermath of the legal aftermath of that uh so attorney tom and alfredo you can you can click on you can visit the site and click on that um and also 
just a few more things I wanted to get out of the out of the way and cover here. Well, at the at the end of August 1985, the well. Okay, there's there's another story to be heard. I'll 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 tell it a little differently than I was going to tell it. Uh, before we do that, let me check up here on on the state of the universe. You got 628 of us of you here now, and 560 likes. That's really good. Thank you guys. Deeply appreciate you hitting that like and subscribe. And I appreciate all 632 of you that are still here. Uh, let's go. Brandon says, "Is the dog cam broken or did I overshoot my morning LSD dosage? It's not broken. I decided it kind of wasn't an appropriate thing for the doggo cam today. Uh, you know, heavy topic and all." But we'll we'll make up for it on on the weekend. <laughs> Irish I was drunk says, "Hey Jeff, I'm late. I'm on holidays. Where are we at here? Hey, cheers. Enjoy your holiday. Wish I was drunk. Thank you so much for being here. The two euros will will supply us for some with some party favors. Stephen Cooper, have you thought about covering the bulk Jupiter? It's on the list. We have we have a lengthy list, and it's going to take us a while to get there. That that one is on the list. So thanks for the input. And Feral Housewife, welcome to the Clean and Sober Crew, our newest member. Thank you so much for that. Uh, back to the story I wanted to tell here. It's an interesting story. Uh, from Popular Mechanics is where this story... The, the, it provides a little bit of a summary. It's not exactly correct. You know, you know it's, as, as we've seen, you'll, you'll see why it's not correct here in a, in a minute. But hang on, I've got to, uh, I've got to bring this on up. Where are we at? I've got so damn many windows open, it's it's scary. <laughs> Where did we go? All right. There we go. The hunt for the Titanic was actually a hunt for lost U.S. nuclear submarines. Let me get rid of the dark screen mode here. There. Well, this isn't exactly true. It wasn't a hunt for lost nuclear submarines but we'll talk about it here. Robert Ballard had to do the Navy a favor before he could proceed with his hunt for the famed ship. That's, that's strawberry snoring there. <laughs> the discovery of the presumably unsinkable Titanic, which hit an iceberg and sunk to the depths of the Atlantic Ocean in 1912, wasn't just part of a scientific search effort. Oh, where do we go here? Uh, <laughs> wait a minute here. I wasn't part of a scientific search effort for the lost ship. It was a secret U.S. military operation to reclaim wayward nuclear submarines that located the ship, according to the 2018 report. Upon discovering the fallen passenger's ship's, passenger ship's location in 1985, Robert Ballard was hailed as a hero for finding the wreckage largely, largely on his own accord. But according to recent declassified events recounted at the National Geographic Museum in Washington, D.C., this isn't entirely true. Ballard's discovery was really part of a U.S. government scheme to outwit the Soviets in the midst of the Cold War. An oceanographer and Navy officer, Ballard was building an underwater research vessel to realize his lifelong dream of finding the Titanic. Unable to source adequate funding for the project, he approached the Navy for help. Deputy Chief of Naval Operations Ronald Thunman was receptive but wanted to bargain. The Navy would allow Ballard to hunt for the Titanic if he promised to find the Thresher and the Scorpion. Well, that's not exactly. We know where they were because the, we, as we talked about here, it was already mapped. It was already it was already photographed. It was found, photographed, and mapped out a year after the accident. Uh, so he, he 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 wasn't searching for the Thresher. He was there to to do a new scan of it, you know, a new check of it, and to, if possible, maybe recover things from it. So it's not exactly accurate, but you know, largely good enough, I guess. Uh, two nuclear submarines were sitting on the Atlantic Ocean floor. The Titan, and, and we had someone ask about covering the Scorpion. I said, I, I'm thinking about whether to do it, and if so, it'll be in a couple of weeks. But the Titanic is between the Thresher and the Scorpion. Yeah, Marcus Alexander says, something's wrong here. The Trieste already dived on Thresher and Scorpion. What was Ballard really doing? Yeah, that's what we're talking about here. He wasn't finding it. Um, so they did not want the world to know. So I had to have a cover story, Ballard told CNN. 
The Thresher and Scorpion, both sunk in the 1960s, were idle troves of nuclear military technology. The Navy was intent on investigating the wreckage without tipping its hand to the Soviet Union that they were there in the first place. So this is the accurate part. He wasn't sent out to find the wreck of the Scorpion and the Thresher. We knew where they were. They just wanted to get him to go investigate it and uh, see if you know what what technology could maybe be salvaged by the Soviets if they found it. But they didn't want the Soviets to know what was going on. Dan keeps saying Soviet, the Russians. Uh, you know, so there we go. Uh, they wanted. I guess it was just still the '80s, so they still were Soviets. Good for me. I'm I'm smart. So yeah, this was the mid '80s, '85. So yeah, they were still Soviets back then. So they, we, they didn't want to tip the hand of the Soviets, so they're like, hey, all right, you can go search for the Titanic. But in the meantime, go check out these two wrecks, you know, investigate them, see what uh, you know, if there's anything that, that if someone else found them, they could salvage you know, nuclear weapons, whatnot, uh, things like that. So they had to do that without tipping their hands. Well, th thank you, Mike and Nam. Appreciate that. Mike and Nam says... I appreciate the way you approach these videos and the respect that you show, bro. Thanks. And great job. Yeah. I, I, I mean, the major loss of life topics are kind of serious, but if there's cannibalism, we're, you know, dog cams on and we're having a good time. If there's cannibalism or anything like that, we're all over that, but where it's just a straight up death of, you know, nearly 120 people. Yeah. A little more serious. <laughs> so they, they wanted me to go back and not have the Russians follow me because we, we were interested in the nuclear weapons that were on the Scorpion, but also on the nuclear reactor, what the nuclear reactors were doing to the environment. So the mission was billed purely as a hunt for the Titanic and media was kept entirely in the dark. The cover didn't provide much relief on the ocean floor. After locating an exam, after examining both submarines, Ballard's team only had 12 days to find the Titanic and, and record their findings. So then the rest of the article just talks about finding the Titanic. So that was kind of an interesting little side note was that uh, the search for the Titanic was also a search to revisit the, the site of the Scorpion and the Thresher and to see if there was anything that could be salvaged by someone else if they'd found it and to sort of inspect the, the uh, situation. All right, it, it is time to wrap up here. Um, some clo some closing thoughts, I guess. Uh, you know, we we have these differing versions of what happened. It was an instantaneous implosion. Uh, the Sea Wolf saying that they were getting signals from what they believed was the Thresher for more than a day after the accident. We have the official Navy line being that none of the things the Sea Wolf heard could have been could have come from a, a human being. And then you have one of the guys involved in, in hearing saying, uh, they were just, they, the things they heard were from other ships. We have these, and why was all of this kept secret for 50, 60 years? You know, historians, engineers, military people, conspiracy theorists, whatever, are going to continue to analyze what happened on that day, April 10th, 1963. The truth of what actually happened lies unreachable. It's just unreachable at the bottom of the ocean off the coast of Massachusetts at 8,400 feet deep. When she was lost on April 10th, 1963, the Navy had declared the thresher, quote, overdue and presumed missing. That's a phrase that harkens back to World War II when many submarines failed to return from their patrols. They were not considered formally sunk or lost, only missing. So the Thresher SSN 593 was not lost. It's only joined her predecessors who never made it home, continuing on an eternal patrol roving the depths of the sea. That brings us here to the end of another Maritime Monday show. Uh, Pinochet's helicopter, Pinochet's, <laughs> I, just, I just love your nickname. I've always loved it. Been a while. Pinochet's helicopter tours. Thank you so much. CIA Project Azorian recovered parts of K-129 in the 70s. Thank you so much for that. Um, again, there's there's no there's no easy way to to bail out on on the end of these. So 
I'll just say thank you to the mods who are here helping me out during the day. Thanks to all of you in chat. The Vice Squad chat is the best. The Maritime Monday streams are an incredibly niche stream that took off in popularity. So we, it was around 100, 100 people we would have every week. Now we routinely have in the six, seven hundreds. So you know, those of you that are interested in this, thank you so much. Vice Squad chat, you guys rock. You're the best. Thank you so much for the, the generosity. What's going to be happening tomorrow, we're going to catch up on the YNW Melly murder trial. We have to go through uh, the afternoon of day 11, where there's going to be some more pictures shown. And also, uh, one of the deceased people, YNW Juvie's mother, is going to take the stand. So we'll do that tomorrow. Wednesday, I'll be joined by Eric Hunley, where we're going to be talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly around surrounding body language expertise. And then we're going to be watching a a body language expert who I think is completely off his rocker. Thursday, we'll be doing OJ Simpson and Friday will be my birthday stream. Same rules essentially as uh, Effort Friday, which Effort Friday will be the following Friday. So we're going to keep birthday and Effort Friday separately. And I'm very, very close to 50,000 subscribers. Last week's Maritime Monday video, uh, I mean, it didn't go viral, but it got picked up a lot, and there was nearly a million impressions on it, and I think it was about 90,000 views, so that that pulled in quite a few subscribers. We we just celebrated 40,000 before the weekend. Now we're at 46, almost 47,000, I think. So the 50,000 subscriber 24-hour stream may not be too far away. So thank you, everybody. Um, We'll be taking care of everything later. Again, thank you all for being here. The like and subscribe poll. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button on your way out. If you've already subscribed, please double check to make sure you are. And our final results for the like and subscribe poll are, did you hit like and subscribe button? 6% of you said, I'm new around these parts, but yes. 16% of you said, thanks for the reminder, done. And 78% of you said, of course. That's the end of the poll. Jim Satala ringing us out with a happy Independence Day. Jeff, I just rolled out of bed. I'm getting ready to drink. <laughs> yes, Independence Day here uh, will actually be celebrated on the 5th on my birthday. So I, that, that's what I'll be doing for my birthday before I join you guys. I'll be going out with the uh, the American contingent. The U.S. Consul is putting on a big uh, 4th of July bash on the 5th of July. So, hey, I do get a big party on my birthday. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care. And there's nobody to uh, raid at the moment, so we'll just send you off into the wild. Take care, everyone. I deeply, deeply appreciate each and every one of you, and I'm glad you were here. Larax out.